and welcome to Pop Screen, part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's podcast devoted to movies either by, starring, or about pop stars. You know the podcast covers such a broad range of musical and cinematic genres, from country and western to hip hop, from documentaries to science fiction. I'm your host, Graham Williamson. I'm a film critic for thegeekshow.co.uk and horrified the British horror website. And I've been joined this week by. I'm Joe Miller. Um, I'm also part of the Geek Show, and I'm I'm behind the Dreaming Machine Animation Podcast. What are the odds, uh, Joe, that the Dreaming Machine will have been released by the time this goes out? Um, we've been recording for like one to two years, I think. It's just I'm sure at some stage <laughs> we'll let, let the public listen to our um, tower recordings. <laughs> you have inexplicably become the my bloody Valentine of podcasts. <laughs> Yeah, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be at the level of Loveless once it's released. It'll be worth the wait, of Absolutely. course. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, this week, listeners, let me just say, there are some who will always know Kristen Bell for her role as Veronica Mars. There are some who will always associate her with Frozen. To me, she will always be the woman who delivered the line, I will not be upstaged by a slut with mutant lungs in Stephen <laughs> Anton's film Burlesque. But apart from Belle getting an early taste of what life's like in The Bad Place, Burlesque also stars Cher, one of the only pop stars to win an acting Oscar, and Christina Aguilera making her screen debut in a film about the then modish burlesque scene she was a vocal advocate of. It seems like a film that could not possibly go wrong, and this podcast is here to explore all of the ways in which it did. <laughs> I have a conf- not a confession, because it's not on my behalf. I, I share your opinion. But um, and when I was talking with my wife about doing this show with you, Graham, um, yeah. and I was making lots of notes about things I wanted to say, and she said, mm-hmm. well, why do you have to make any notes? And why will it last longer than two minutes? All you have to say is, it's an awesome film. And like Christina Aguilera is fantastic. And that's all you need to say. Join us next week on Pop Screen when <laughs> we'll be good. <laughs> I, I, I think there is a bit more to say than that, actually. <laughs> It's a film that has its fan base, let's say that. Um, It does. Maybe not for myself, but it does have its fan base out there. And, you know, I I went into it wanting to be part of that fan base. uh, Because I I don't like to go in expecting the worst in any movie. But can can we just talk about one of the things that really exercises me about the reception to this is that Cher later said that she thought the movie was terrible uh but she said she thought the movie was terrible because she didn't have a love interest in it now joe do you think this movie would be great if Cher had a love interest god no (laughs) even faster answer than i expected thank you for that um the issue i have major issues with the film And I have Mm. minor issues with the film. Um, One of the major issues for me is Christina Aguilera, you know, as good as she is at acting in this, you know, she's obviously very talented. Her character arc is non-existent. She's just awesome from the start. Yeah, I, I think we need to go through this in order because when I started watching this, my first thought was, have I accidentally clicked like, 10 or 15 minutes into the film mm. because it starts with her as a waitress in a high yo because you have no cliche left unembraced <laughs> and it i was trying to work out what was wrong with this scene i think it's because it's all shot in close-ups but this is like the only scene that you get that establishes ali her character and the world that she comes from before she goes to hollywood and it's just a series of close-ups of faces of hands of cash registers you are literally not seeing the world that she exists in and it is so truncated and so bizarre But then that's also the rest of the setup because she just arrives in Hollywood and rather than having some sort of burning dream that she has to fight to pursue, she sort of walks into the first nightclub she sees and goes, oh yeah, burlesque dancing, I could do that. Yeah, I mean, she's not even that freaked out by it. I mean, it's what what, the second major issue which you've touched on there is 
it's unoriginal and recycles hmm. all these cliches. I mean, as you say, she literally works in a diner at the start of the movie. Yes. Uh, they have to raise money to to save the club. Uh, it has that cliche in too. It, it yes. has. Yeah, it doesn't quite go have the fun you can have with those cliches. It pulls back from it, so it doesn't fully commit to it. Hmm. So, you know, she's not that freaked out by the club. It's not a massive compared to like Coyote Ugly or something where it's like a total fish out of water. Yeah. Or, you know, the, I mean, that what I mentioned there about saving the club is not that they have to do one last concert to like, to like save the club, like a minute before this you to be repossessed or something. It's mm. this weird financial blackmail scheme that, that is out of nowhere, that kind of sort. So they don't, they don't fully commit to the cliches. Yeah, it's still very cliched. It's a really strange combination, I think. It's true, yeah. I mean, I can go for a cliched storyline in some a genre like a musical because they're the compensatory pleasures. You know, no one want to to misquote the old cliche. No one wants to walk out of a musical humming the script. But it, it's just. I don't know, the, the setup is problematic in that Ali seems to not really want anything and not really have any trouble getting it. Yeah, yeah, she I mean, exactly. She I mean it's good it's good she's confident and she's likable, etc. But she she just she can do everything. She's perfect. I mean mm. I mean the movie was like a message to me that I need to worship her and we all need to follow her for the world to be a better place. That's the only message it's like <laughs> just she's she does everything and even when she finally gets the chance to sing because they're weirdly reticent to let her even sing a single note while she's there and she really has to like prove prove herself mm. and the reaction is oh my god someone who can sing as well as dance this is gonna draw punters <laughs> from the world over a double threat <laughs> <laughs> just, and it even comes up she's the one who comes up with that financial scheme to save the club in the end i didn't know she could do uh, oh yeah she's yeah. also one of the world's great businessmen as well yeah and so, yeah so there's no we don't really know anything about her they don't really dip much into a backstory later on like i expected um, no all right um and so there's just nowhere to go except to acknowledge her her brilliance i mean I, it it's kind of weird too, isn't it? Because you would think that the audience for a film starring Christina Aguilera would be, at the very least, tolerant towards Christina Aguilera. Like, you don't need to expend this much effort persuading us that she is good at singing. It, exactly. Um, so it's... I mean, even, even the first scene when she starts singing, um, I just couldn't believe... When I first saw it, it nearly knocked me off my seat. I thought, okay, <laughs> she's a diner waitress. They're setting her yes. up as to be modest and and she she has a talent, but she's shy about using it, that kind of thing. She, as soon as she belts out the first note, I was like, geez, this is just go and get record, just go and get a recording deal, you're fine. Yes. <laughs> Who do you have to prove yourself to? So um, so yeah, like. It just hammers home what, as you say, what a great singer she is to everyone who's already aware of what a fantastic, very powerful singer she is. Um, and it's weird too, because this is one of the points where the film's structure almost works. And that is the best it gets, the bits where it has structure that almost works. Mm. Because, as you say, she has to go through hell to try and persuade Tess, the Cher character who owns the burlesque club she ends up dancing at, she has to persuade her to let her sing on stage. And this gets built up and built up and built up until there is a point where uh, one of her rivals, the Kristen Bell character, sabotages her performance and cuts out the backing track and she has to sing live. And that seems to be written as the big point where she has to prove herself. But we've already heard her sing Etta James like to herself in a bar in a, in a fashion that makes you wonder if any surrounding buildings have been left standing <laughs> at the end of this. So, you know, wh where's the jeopardy in this? We know she can do it. What's... I think the biggest jeopardy is um, clearly uh, Cher, sorry, whatever her character's called, but Cher, mm. and her ex 
husband have been badly running the club. I mean, there was a financial crisis, to be fair, but like they seem to be quite popular already. Like when she joins, yeah. Them. <laughs> That's the weird thing, isn't it? That the, the I, I was trying to work out what kind of club this was supposed to be, and I think it's the it's the hottest nightclub in town, and also no one wants to go there, and it's losing money hand over fist. It, exactly. It, it just doesn't make consistent sense. I, I do. I should add, to be fair, there is well, it's not even a character flaw, but there's this criticism of a, of Christina Aguilera's character for, um, for Ali um, for going to um, you know hanging around with that sleaze, sleazy guy, right? So mm. that, that, that's a that's a one flaw of a character. Although she doesn't actually do anything. This is when she's with him, and it actually leads to her discovering what his plans are for the club. Um, but that's the furthest it goes, so it it just had one nod to her being misled or something. But even then, she's pretty much perfect. Yeah, we we should talk about that romantic subplot because it, it eats up most of the back half of the film and indeed eats into my will to live. Because whereas the first half of Burlesque is kind of campy and funny in a bad movie way if you're into it, the mm. second half of Burlesque is all Christine Aguilera love triangle and shares financial mismanagement. And for a film about Burlesque, this just sucks you down into a black <laughs> hole. No one cares. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I won't argue with that. I think... Um, he, I mean... His character becomes less likable as well. Uh, the love mm. interest as the film goes on, I think, as well. You know, they have a nice little back and forth when she first goes to the club and he looks out for her. But then he's criticizing her for saying out late at night when they're not even in a relationship. And yeah, and have, what's that about? It, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's it just made me think he's a jerk. Um, yeah, I mean, at that stage, I, I found. I mean, he's a total sleaze, but the other guy at least is trying to offer financial help. <laughs> to <this Yes>. <laughs> no, he is a sleaze. He is a sleaze. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just weird. I mean, I guess if you're into that kind of, um, they're clearly trying to go for, I don't know, not quite a screwball comedy, but like, ha- you know, people they want people to really like him and have this back and forth and make a yeah. love level, I guess. I think one of the big problems with the love triangle plot is that they have cast two actors who have such a kind of generic, like, late noughties supernatural program on the CW network look about them (laughs) that it actually took me quite a long time to work out there were two different love interests for Christina in this. It, it's just another thing thrown into the mix. Mm. Is it? Um, I mean, I think the the love, the relationship side, I was more interested in. Probably was Cher's character and like the relationship with her ex husband, and also Stanley Tucci's character as well. Yeah, what the hell is she on about saying she doesn't have a love interest? Because she she has this ex husband who looks like a bad police sketch of Rob Lowe, but. <laughs> Okay, that that's like her ex. That's not a real love interest, but it, it's pretty plainly stated that she had slept with Sean, the Stanley Tucci character, who was gay. So, Cher not only has a love interest, she is turning the unavailable men of the burlesque club. And what what more does she want? I don't get it. Yeah, and she, I mean, she just fully commit to the role. Um, hmm to be really into it at the time i mean i didn't realize she she'd been negative about it afterwards um because, um i was saying to you before i read an entertainment weekly um vocal but uh, oral history of it and they have like one line from Cher saying oh i like this song in it actually i guess that's <laughs> but um christina aguilera the director um they're all like full of praise about it but it's just interesting that she she went off it afterwards i guess it was the last up until the Mamma Mia film, was the last chance to like really show off her vocals right, in the film, really. Yeah, that's true. And I think, you know, one of the things with someone like Cher is that 
the longer her career goes on, the harder it is to cast her as anything that isn't basically Cher. And she had a good run of doing films in the 80s, like Silkwood, which, you know, in which she plays an ordinary working class American and does that far better than a mm. pop star with one name has any right to do. But mm. you can only do that for so long, I think. Yeah, I mean, Christina Aguilera isn't, is being this other character where Cher is just being Cher, I think, mm. in the movie. I think that's fair to say. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's just weird. It's just very inconsistent the way it goes through. I mean, I mean, they were the, the major issues for me. There were lots of minor issues too, um, which we should go through and pick apart, right? That's what oh, we're God. here for. Got a long list of them. I mean, just out of nowhere, Alan Cummings' character. Um, yeah. So he disappears for most of the movie. Returns briefly to say I caramba at the character. <laughs> Um, Famous burlesque icon Bart Simpson here, yes. I can remember at the, at the camera, sorry. Um, then he disappears. Yeah. Okay. And Alan Cumming is shamelessly sort of shoehorned into this because he did a very, very famous turn as the MC in Cabaret on Broadway. And this film is absolutely desperate to fool you into thinking this yeah. might have been a Bob Fosse project at some point. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely indebted, for sure. Um, but as I say, they don't fully commit to it. It's, it's weird. <laughs> they, they go halfway there. Well, the, the weird thing about it is that it starts off with the biggest nod, uh, which is when... Ali first goes into the burlesque club and they literally do the thing from Chicago where she watches the opening number and imagines herself on stage belting out the closing note, literally the same thing. Um, but th yeah, then as you say, it's kind of half-baked and I have some theories on why that might be. It's... <laughs> I wouldn't say I know everything about musical form. There's still so much about musicals that I find mysterious and fascinating, but I can recognise when something is structured like a musical and I can recognise when it's not. And this is structured like an album. <laughs> uh, okay, that's interesting. Um... It feels like, because one of the things that musicals have to have is that you have to have a consistent voice throughout. And that doesn't mean all of the songs have to be in the same style. Mm. But even if you do have a musical which is full of pastiches of different styles, as many are, I think it has to be written by the same people and you have to be able to see the same sensibility behind it. Whereas this is done in a way which is more akin to a modern pop album where it's got like a trillion songwriters and a trillion producers, and it's meant to be held together by a force of personality. And, you know, there are a lot of pop albums where that works, but you cannot do it in a musical, I think. That's very interesting you say that. It, it, the songs did have a lot of writers, and they even brought in people from Christina Aguilera's like, yeah. album I've been working on, like, which has very similar themes. Um, and there was even um, the director was against the inclusion of um, Cher's solo number, um, you know, where she has to rehearse it and has no bear, it has no relation to the plot whatsoever. Yes, yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's not the only musical to do that. I mean, singing in the rain goes off on a tangent for fifteen minutes. I remember. <laughs> so, it's, so you know, some musicals do that. That's fine, but it's. But yeah, it's very disjointed. Is that which share uh, song are you thinking? Is it the sort of ballad that she sings when we first find out about the financial, the the eighties, the eighties uh, power ballad? Yes, yeah. That no, that's the one that I think kind of works in plot terms in that it comes as a plot fulcrum. It shows the character expressing the emotions they feel about that plot twist. So that is a more understandable thing to have in a musical I think than most of the rest of them which is like let me just read you some of these track titles welcome to burlesque show me how you burlesque <laughs> another song with burlesque in the title 
boy, do I ever like burlesque. I'm making some of these up, but you get the point. <laughs> like, they, this is what I mean when I say it's album stuff. If you're doing an album, it doesn't matter if you've got like 10 songs about love or some other theme. But if you're doing a musical, the songs have to be, it, you have to be able to differentiate them. You have to be able to say, oh, that's the song that happens when she meets so-and-so, or that's the song that happens when such and such happens. And Almost yeah. all of the songs here are, that's the song that happens when they're doing a burlesque show. To be fair, like you're right, Cher's number, the, the one I mentioned, does show her emotional state at that time. So it, mm. it does have a relation. I still think it, it should be woven into the plot a bit better, though. Uh, so oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah. It, <laughs> right, it's, it's late, but you need to rehearse this. Uh, okay, like, I'll rehearse it, like, but give everything and, <laughs> you know, and do this little... <laughs> you know, emote for camera and everything, but whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, it doesn't really say much about burle- burlesque itself, actually, despite the, <laughs> despite the folk, despite the movie title. I don't feel <laughs> there's all these other elements. Um, but as you say, the songs don't really say anything. Mm. There's all these random plot elements throw in, thrown in. There's no journey at all. Um, I don't feel I've learned anything about burlesque. Except like yeah. don't let don't let share manage <laughs> <laughs> by being charged of the finances of the club like that. Yeah, that's true. I, I when you were talking about the the decision to not let people sing on stage, I did briefly wonder. Oh, but is that some sort of thing in burlesque? Is lip syncing supposed to be part of the art? And then I thought, you know what? If it is, I'm never going to find out from this film. Yeah, it's it just it's just very shallow. It doesn't really, and it, it's very inconsistent. And I think that's a big problem throughout. I mean, having said that, I, I wonder if the reason it has is maybe developing a cult following. If you read certain sections online, and mm. and there's talk of a new TV spinoff as well. <laughs> Golden Age of TV, guys. <laughs> it's because it's kind of comfort food and, and is reassuring if you're into that kind of thing. Like it doesn't have to make sense or it doesn't have to make sense. It's just um <laughs> it's just re- reheating going through all these cliches again. And yes, it... like, stars sing these fun songs. You know what? I kept thinking about in terms of a film that hits a lot of very cliched small town girl hits it big plot beats, but does it in a way that actually works. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking of Whip It. Well, I've not seen Whip It. Oh, you must see Whip It. Uh, uh, The further and further we get away from Whip It, the more concerned I am that Drew Barrymore has not directed another (laughs) film because Mm -hmm. I think we should be getting UN negotiators in to force her to do that at some point. But you Mm. know, Whip It has a load of cliched plot beats. You know, the central character is forced into beauty contests, but she wants to be a roller derby girl. Does the big beauty contest happen on the same night of the big role, the Derby show? Mm, I'd hate to spoil it for you. And yet everything in that movie works. And it just makes me think, oh, you know, fine if you enjoy it as comfort food. Fine if you enjoy it for camp value. For half of the film, I'm right with you there. You know, I was giggling throughout the first half. But you can have a film that is comforting and predictable and is also basically well made. Mm. Yeah, um, it, it's, yeah, that's a good point, really. Um, it, well, they, they're not, they've not been lazy in the way they made it. I'm reading that oral history, they clearly went through a lot of strife to make the film. Um, Whoa, ho, spill some of that, because that, that, that is like, you know, those films like Fitzcarraldo, where all of the pressures of making it are on the screen. This mm. is the opposite. Because <laughs> I, um, I think they had to go through, like, the equivalent of the Hunger Games to get Cher on board, like they, they had, to... <laughs> um, and they, they camped outside, like when when they knew Cher was on the, the on the lot. Then they got her to sing that um, '80s power ballad by the songwriter, um, getting Cher's friend into it, and getting her to text Cher. It's it just like there's a lot of stuff like that, and there was a 
disagreements with the head of the studio and the director. Um, they reshot the ending. There's a lot of, and and you know, like they did put a lot of effort into the dance numbers, choreography. They really committed to it. Christina Aguilera loved the vibe of it and had notes on the character when. But it just doesn't really come across on screen. That's the problem. <laughs> like all yeah. this, I, I accept they worked really hard in it and they really cared about it, but it just doesn't. You can see they're having fun like, acting it. But I think um, Cher, Christina, um, Stanley Tucci, who really stood out for me, they're having a lot of fun with their characters, but it's just so, the result's so meh. It's so underwhelming. We, we keep mentioning this list of songwriters, and I, I think listeners might not take us seriously when we say it is the most insane list of songwriters <laughs> ever assembled. It's like, yeah, you, you look at all those Beyonce albums where they've got like tons of really hot shot R and B producers and also Ross Stam from Vampire Weekend or something, and you think that's pretty crazy, but it's not this crazy. <laughs> Because Welcome to Burlesque has lyrics uh, by the award-winning playwright John Patrick Shanley. Okay. Uh, you haven't seen The Last of Me, the Cher ballad that we've been talking about, is written by Diane Warren, one of the most awarded songwriters in American popular music. Um, there's a completely forgettable ballad that Christina sings, which is written by Sia. And I think they must have got her at the last possible moment when every single Sia song wasn't just like yelling for four solid minutes <laughs> because it doesn't sound like titanium at all. So that's quite weird. Um, it opens with an Etta James cover. It follows it up with a, a Madeleine Manson cover. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think even before Marilyn Manson hit the point where he had more rape allegations against him than actual recent hit singles, that was still a very incongruous thing to put in. Yeah, it, it, it's it's just all over the place. It, it really is. And yet they still managed to get air rights into the plot somehow, like, alongside <laughs> all of that. <laughs> um, yeah, and as you say, like, you know, like you, someone could enjoy those songs, I guess. Like, mm. you can do anything for me, really, but I can see some people enjoying those. But it, it was just all over the place. It, it really is. Um, and, and it's all over the place, but in a way that just doesn't work. I wrote down two moments that I thought worked in the oh, film. Oh, this is good. Yeah. Both and Fall, San, Stanley Tucci um, character, Sean. Uh, Sean's his name, right? Um, mm. So him giving relationship advice to, you know, that, that asshole boyfriend. Um, yes. But to, to become the love interest, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then he, then uh, she ends up at his house and he's with his, uh, his latest boy on the side. And then he turns around and takes his own advice and invites him to lunch. I thought, oh, that's a genuinely sweet in-character moment and it is consistent with what's happened it's a callback it shows you that the script was not as it often appears to be ad-libbed <laughs> typed in real time whilst they act it um yes and then the second moment also involved him was when um shares like is giving up about the, <laughs> the terrible i don't know why i find it so funny this financial situation in the club i just think it's so Left. It's exactly what you turn into a film called Burlesque about, aren't you? you you're <laughs> hoping that this has loads of hot real estate action. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, yeah. So I totally got my fix of real estate action, as you say. It was, it was fantastic for that. Um, <laughs> and she's given up, and he, he, he say, and Sean says to her, um, "Oh well, you know, we should just give up." Is a terrible situation we can't do anything and he does this reverse psychology trick mm. and you know the standard was set so low that like <laughs> when, <laughs> when he turns around and says ah that's the person i remember that's a uh, share whatever the name in the film is share what well, well, that's share i remember <laughs> and it's like oh cool that, that, that kind of you know that was a likable moment yeah. i guess I mean, I've read people quite like the makeup scene and when their characters like actually talk to each other 
a little it gets, bit. Although, isn't it absolutely mad that Cher has to basically tell Christine Aguilera what eyeliner is? It's like she, she, she I, I could get it if she, her styling before this was as a sort of a wallflower type, but. Uh, again, because mm. Christine Aguilera has to be brilliant in every department in this movie, you see her working as a waitress and she looks like a fucking megastar right from the get-go. So wh why why is Cher telling her what makeup is? I mean, you know, I'm not one of the people who loves that scene. I, I think it's, like, just random. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I've read people online quite like that scene. Um, I don't know i'm the wrong person to ask i, I don't give good makeup tips or like, <laughs> maybe, i guess it's maybe it's, but we don't know anything about her family really do we um no at least in it we don't know so i guess it would be more touching if we knew about her relationship with her parents a little more like they, they briefly reference it i guess but but it doesn't have any bearing on her as a person or the plot in any wider context now you mention it, it is quite odd that it doesn't go for the absolutely dead obvious trick of having a come from a very conservative religious background. Yeah, it's like the burlesque has <laughs> weirdly nothing to do with the plot whatsoever. The it, more it, about it. it liberates her from whoever the hell she is before. Yeah, this is the what, what did we learn about burlesque from this movie? What, what do you think you, you got from it? Well, I've repeatedly said the main lesson, you know, don't let... I mean, it's not even the, it's not even the financial mismanagement. It's the fact that she forces them to lip sync. She doesn't let her audition. You can make an argument. <laughs> you can make an argument. She's not actually good at running the, the club in general. <laughs> <laughs> That is kind of, it's like that old anecdote about the record company executive who threw the Beatles demo in the bin and said, oh, guitar groups are on the way out. Maybe Cher's <laughs> just been sitting there for decades going, attractive women singing on stage. <laughs> I'd like to see people turn up for that. <laughs> I think that she's really involved in it, really cares about it, but maybe her character's holding back the club. <laughs> <laughs> That would be the, the ultimate ending, wouldn't it? That would put some character growth in it if Stanley Tucci or someone could say to her, look, at, you, you're an absolute darling, but you're just shit at running a burlesque group. <laughs> I can't believe we haven't said this to you before. I mean, I, I learned that. I mean, I learned from... Um, I learned from um, uh, the, ri the, the character of the rival... Um, Chris, Chris, and um, Chris and Bell, yes. Well, thank you. Sorry. Um, and, you know, I was just saying, oh, she's from the good place. Wow, that's that's cool. Like, I we didn't realize the first time I saw it. Um, you you can do anything you want and not get fired. I learned that from the movie. <laughs> yes, apps <laughs> that listeners, if you've ever thought of getting into burlesque, uh, but you have say a drink problem or an antisocial behaviour <laughs> problem, or you're an escaped murderer who's worried you're going to kill again, maybe according to this, doesn't matter. They'll just let you in, whoever you have. Yeah, I mean, she literally cut the power mid performance. And even cackled to herself and didn't even do it that secretly. She's drunk before she goes on stage every single night. I mean, th this is one of the weird things, isn't it? Because I, I feel like that noughties 2010s revival of burlesque was very, very heavy on people saying, oh, it's not like stripping, you know, it's not just to turn sad old men on, you know, this is a, this is a real art form and you have to have a discipline to it and, you know, it's a, it can be satirical or it can tell a story. And I think this film wants to sell you on those ideas too, but that you can't argue that and have Kristen Bell walk on completely wankered every night. <laughs> yeah, enough said, like for sure. And um, I mean, they try to gloss over it by saying they're a, they're a family, you know, it's a family for them, but but <laughs> they're not really. Well, they're very nah. just like they don't they don't do enough to establish that as a thing. Um, and you know, they even let her drink drive, like she just lets her character like 
drink drink drive like off into the distance <laughs> and this... well we're like a family we enable each other's destructive behavior <laughs> it's it's really it's just really weird as a film what did i learn about burlesque um <laughs> what did you learn about burlesque from the film well i always have this kind of when it was going through this period of revival, um, I had this very mixed feeling about it where I had some friends who were involved in like burlesque troops and who really enjoyed it and said they helped them feel, you know, powerful and good about their bodies after oh. times in their life when they struggled to do that. Uh, and I get all that, but the way it was written about and the way that people sort of wanted to assure you that oh, it's okay you can enjoy this just makes me think all oh, right it's stripping for middle class people i get you and that is a very very uncharitable view of the burlesque scene that i would like to make it clear that i do not co-sign but this film does as soon as christina goes into the burlesque club and meets alan cumming as the mc from cabaret you know she says, oh, it's, it's a strip club. And Cumming reacts with horror at the idea that anyone would think this club where women cavort around stage in lingerie lip syncing to Marilyn Monroe songs <laughs> has anything to do with strip clubs whatsoever. And I just think if you're going to make a film about burlesque that actually delves into the scene, I think the first thing you have to get past is that kind of snobby reaction to it that a lot of journalists who wrote about it have because that's not what it is and yet it, in this film that absolutely buys into the myth yeah i think that's a really good point um it's i mean one thing i'll say is they do try to show um the women in the film as being strong and in control um and show them in a positive like empowered set which is good mm. yeah but they gloss with a very glossy, superficial view of burlesque, right? it makes it look like very, I don't know, like, like you, you see the patrons, like, are all, they're all, like, really into it, and they're fantastic, but it, it just seems like, it just feels like a false, it, it's empowering, but only, um, but they don't actually comment on burlesque at all, or go into any detail of it, or look at, like, who's there, or, like, what the show is, and, and they're kind of attitudes to it are very inconsistent, as you say. And when it needs to sell a, a story beat that is kind of sadder, when it's at a sad point in Christina's dull love triangle, she basically just goes on stage and sings a jazz ballad in like a neck to floor ball gown. And you think, okay, well, I can see you, you've got your hang ups here. Maybe I'm entirely wrong. Maybe there are loads of burlesque clubs where like the, the dancers just wear ball gowns. But mm. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's true somehow. Yeah, it, it feels false. I mean, mm. I expected that going into it, I would say. Um, but, but there's nothing to hold on to. So it's not the best portrayal of burlesque. Are the characters like really interesting? Do they go through interesting arcs? No, they don't. Mm. Is, the, is the relationship really witty and is the dialogue fantastic? No, not really. <laughs> is the, do the songs tie together? Is it like a classic musical? No, not really. I think people are pushing it when they say that, like personally. Mm. But I just, there's nothing to hold on to. The thing you can hold on to most is, and I've come around on it, maybe the finance mismanagement is the heart of the movie. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's basically Wall Street in fishnets. Maybe that's it. <laughs> I mean, maybe I should, instead of making all these notes and learning about the film, maybe I should be learning more about air rights <laughs> in the real estate market. I mean, but I, got, I mean, there's even more cliches I can think of. Like, she goes past a Hollywood sign on the way to the club, doesn't she, at the start? And... Mulholland Drive is literally the only film I will allow to get away with that, yes. And, um, <laughs> true. Um, and the original ending I read was um, she's on the stairwell, he's getting in the taxi, and then they go back and run back to each other and have a romantic kiss. And 
and that got X, like they cut that for even that was too cliched even for them kind of thing. <laughs> um and they reshot it. Yeah, it just has it just has too many issues, I think. Um it's uh, when if he doesn't portray burlesque, you're looking for something to hold on to. Like you're looking and, you for know, a plot, the plot, yeah. The, the greatest showman um glosses over some of uh uh, some of you know the P.T. Barnum's act. horrific racism and exploitation. Oh, for sure. Yeah, um, just a bit. Which, this doesn't justify that, but the songs are quite catchy. At yeah. least it has it has something going for it. Um, mm. and it's it has a very single vision in terms of like how it's filmed. You know, it's quite impressive. Like, it's very glossy. Mm. It, there's something to hold on to if you overlook. Like the history of it, <laughs> which is that it's too far for many people, but but I think um yeah, there's just nothing going for burlesque. I don't I don't quite get the cult, the burgeoning cult following or where that's coming from. I guess maybe you don't get maybe you don't get that many movies like this anymore. Maybe maybe that's why it's quite fresh in a way. I think that's true. I remember when it came out in 2010, I was quite surprised that there was something coming out that was like a big old fashioned pop star movie because Mm. Christine Aguilera had been famous for a very long time when she made this. She'd been famous since I think 1999 was when her first single came out. Mm. And this is 2010. So she's got a good decade in there. And she had never made a movie. And no one thought that was odd because in the early noughties, you had this spate of things like Crossroads with Britney Spears, uh, from Justin to Kelly with Kelly Clarks and things that basically buried the idea of the pop star movie for a decade. I would say it's, it's not really until the Lady Gaga version of A Star is Born that people kind of exhaled a bit and allowed themselves to like a classic sort of pop star vehicle on screen. Yeah, that's true. And there is, there is room for that. I mean, mm. those things are quite fascinating and, and fun. You know, it, it ties in nicely to your podcast, obviously. Like, there's, a, there's tons of analogies. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you talk about, Joe. I hate them. I'm, I'm only doing this podcast as part of my community service. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. You one person I don't need to say that point to, but um, but yeah. So I guess I, I feel I, mean, I don't want to be patronising. People like what they like. It's just, it's just I wonder if that's part of it. If there was more competition from other similar films, maybe some of its flaws would be more. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think the no, I, I think that's absolutely true. And you know, I'm I'm as guilty of it as anyone. I will happily like overlook the flaws in a lot of new Hollywood westerns because you don't get many westerns and I like westerns. But yeah, I, I I do get that. I think it came at an odd point in Christina's career as well, because like I say, she hadn't made a film and people thought that that was normal that she just decided that was a bad idea and then she makes this film 10 years into her career and it's like the film that pop stars make when they're just about to release their second album it's like a standard sort of rise to fame drama about small town girl with not not very much of a dream in this case a small town (laughs) girl who walks into a room one day and (laughs) patronizingly decides that she could do the job of the people on stage only better um and she does so that's great but you know why did she wait 10 years to do this it's i I don't know i mean the vibe i get is she she just wanted to do a movie um Mm. like she was bored she she just wanted to do (laughs) to do a movie i mean she she does like she acts well in it. She, she I think her acting's good. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah, yeah. It's just um, but you're right. It's, it's kind of a a weird time in her career. I I, I put it down to boredom, but like I, I don't really I can't give you an answer really. It, it, that wasn't covered in like what I've read about it. I, I just know mm. that her management contacted the studio and said Christina wants to do a movie. Oh like, really. Well, what have you got for her? Uh, and they put her in touch with the director um, who, you know, had already developed a show for his uh, Pussycat Doll troupe, uh, part, 
uh, sister. And that'd be ah. really, so that, that, that was the genesis of that idea. So, um, so, you know, I mean, the fact that it came from that original show, like, demonstrates, you know, the interest in this kind of film of people wanting to have this escape. Yeah. It's escapism, because it's not, as you say, it's not really burlesque or or, or reflection. It's not even a, a proper Rags to Riches story, really. I think, mm. um, I was just thinking that, like, just as a random thought. I mean, it'd be interesting if you recut it with her with her character being the villain throughout. <laughs> 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 but she just you know one of the dancers says it maybe she's got a point she just waltzes in here just starts yeah. waiting on tables you know no one's asked her to um you know she is she's got in yeah you know, she doesn't have much money but she's got a relatively carefree life you know and she just takes over they push when you describe it it's it sounds a bit like this is gorman gast and she's steer pike uh, you might have to explain those references to me, but <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe it's not that good a joke for, for the last <laughs> half. But yeah, Mervyn Peake's novel Gorman Gast about a, a sort of fantasy kingdom where a maladjusted young servant boy ends up murdering his way to the top. Wow, it's I mean, good, Gorman Gast. You should read it. That sounds really, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um... Yeah, you, you could definitely recut it that way, I think. That would be fun. Mm. <laughs> uh it's it's just uh it's just all over the place, I think. Um but you know, it, it's got they 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 give them all it, it's got songs in it. There are definitely songs, it's no definitely one could deny that. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um Christina though, because we're probably going to get quite a few shots at talking about Cher on this show, and we will yeah. likely talk about them for movies that make much better use of Cher. But this is likely to be the only time we talk about Christina Aguilera on the show, so we should we should talk about our feelings towards Christina. Mm. Agreed. <laughs> uh, I am hypothetically in favour of that course of action. Well, I mean, the movie wants us to talk about yeah. everything. Was I mean, we are. She is a, a god. Like that's this is the main message I got from the movie. Christina the Redeemer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that that rhyme is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, she was because when she first came around, I was in my early to mid teens, so I was obviously far too much of a snob to want to listen to like anything like that i'm much more of a mainstream pop fan now than i have been since i was like since my age was in single figures um <laughs> so it says something that when she released that it wasn't her second album she released like things like a christmas album in between her first two proper albums but yeah. her second album proper stripped the one that had beautiful and dirty and can't hold us down and fight her on it her peak, yeah. Her commercial. When she, put, when she yeah. put that out, I thought, fuck me, this is good. And, you know, I, I've set this story up just to impress upon you listeners that I was not in the habit of thinking that mainstream pop stars were doing really good work back then. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a big statement. And that really, I mean, she, it felt like she could do anything then, I think. Um, and she mm. had a couple of albums after where, her like commercial um the commercial impact like maybe lessened a bit and like she yeah. went kind of, I mean she had a um like that ain't no other lover song which was like great like very uh, 50s vibe which yes. I thought was like, a great pop song I Agreed. mean yeah it's still big it's still big but by her standards it wasn't as big um, I remember, yeah, that, that album, Back to Basics, I remember that being quite big. But the first big setback she had was actually in the same year that Burlesque came out. And I think the like one, two of this and Burlesque probably yeah. really did for her. But uh, that that was bionic. And it was just, it was kind of disappointing because every single Christine album before that had had a big concept, which nowadays every pop star does this. Every pop star has to have Eva's, but back then she was one of the mm. few who was doing this. And her first album is straight up mainstream Disney pop. Yeah. 
the second album is all right here's the entire breadth of what i can do and then the next album as you say was going back to this kind of do wop and jazz and blues influence which again something no one else was doing at that point and then bionic comes out and, <laughs> and the concept is what if i'm a sexy robot yeah <laughs> uh, yeah well i guess that's kind of interesting yeah and this is at exactly the same time that Lady Gaga is also doing What If I'm a Sexy Robot and she's just started out and she's huge. In retrospect, it is also a problem that, you know, Janelle Monet has just started out and she's doing What If I'm a Sexy Robot and also the single great artist of my generation, which is a hard act to follow. But it, it felt like we were very <laughs> saturated in sexy robots around that time. I mean, that, that's a great point. And um, if there's one thing you, you would have thought the world wouldn't be saturated in, it would be sexy, sexy <laughs> robots, I guess. But, <laughs> but maybe, I, I'm clearly naive. I mean, I was thinking Janelle Monet like, when you started saying your point, actually. Um, yeah. I don't know if, I mean, in the, in the things I've read about the movie, like, obviously the initial reception, the commercial reception was like 90 million at the box office, but it did quite well on like home release sales um, it's not bad is it it's not as big a bomb as people remember it being yeah um but the way they talk about it obviously the, the very much have vested interest is like um the loss of you know sometimes if you have a pop star vehicle you you this loss of negativity and critical mm. uh criticism can come up from um and, and so they said it was more about her and wanting to take her down kind of thing. I don't really buy that at all, but, but it is, it's, it's interesting though. Um, you know, there was a, but to be fair, there was a lot of focus on clearly her and Cher being the stars of the movie, as you'd expect. It is a pop star vehicle at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Well, that's at least how it's presented. Um, and uh, yeah, you could argue that one too, as you say, with the album as well. Um, it kind of set her on the decline, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But I don't know as well if you if some pop stars have a natural shelf life. Like it's incredibly hard to say at that peak, like at least commercially, like throughout a whole career. Like these things do go up and down really. You can't think I can't think of many pop stars where they just say at that level all the way through. It's strange, isn't it? Because um one of the big pop stories of last year was Taylor Swift's lockdown albums. And you can see that as being, I mean, Taylor Swift hasn't had a career setback as devastating as releasing Bionic and Burlesque in the same year. Yeah. But that those albums are clearly her like planning an escape route of making something that is still huge and still sells vast quantities, but doesn't have to be at the cutting edge of mainstream pop, which is, you know, a place where she is in her early 30s and she's competing with people like Billie Eilish and Olivia Rodrigo. It's understandable that you would want to think, all right, I can pull this off now, but in five years, in 10 years, you know, so you plan your escape while you can, I guess. Yeah, and you... I don't know if it's a Vogue thing or if it's been around for a while, but where you can say, this is my smaller album. Like, we're all these, yeah. like, very famous collaborators and songwriters, etc. but this is my small album. So there's less pressure for this to be a big thing. Like, I can get away with that kind of thing. Um, Gaga, Lady Gaga did a, a quite sustained period of experimenting with being boring. And she was really good <laughs> at that, I thought. She was, she was so dull. That it was, she was like a natural to it. Wow. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to doing the Star is Born episode on this show. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, um, yeah, I think her performance in the film is good. Mm. Um, I mean, the problems are definitely with her character. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know, be, being Superman. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I wonder if she was naturally you know I think if you have a big hit single you can kind of ride out like a slightly underperforming movie but one that still did okay uh, I, yeah. I don't know if that's really the cause of her like, her decline commercially I think I think it might 
But, you know, it, it didn't help, though, did it, at the same time? And it also kind of doesn't make sense. I think if this film had been released two or three years before, people would probably have still, you know, given it stinking reviews because it's not very good. But they would also said, uh, oh, well, that makes sense as part of the sort of back to basics, old school stuff that she's doing. And then a few years later, if she wants to be a sexy robot, find her a script about a sexy robot. I'm sure there's one out there. But <laughs> it has this weird feeling where it is slightly out of date and it's two projects, the film and the album, that really needed one to pull the other up. And yeah. it turns out they both dragged each other down. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair comment. Um poor Christina. I mean she's yeah. so her character's so perfect. Uh, <laughs> yes. Why can't we all just be more like her? Uh, yeah, I, I have the what would Ali in burlesque do bumper sticker <laughs> on my car right now. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she is good, but I mean, her vocals are quite. Um, it's marmite in the in whether you like them or not. Like clearly, technically, they're very impressive. But yeah, I mean, there were moments in the movie, especially the, the second time I watched it, where <sighs> there's an amount of the length of time she told a certain note and say, look at me, look at me. it irritate me a little bit. Um, especially I when get I... what you mean. I normally find that vocal delivery kind of irritating, although I generally let it slide with her because, you know, sometimes you, you just can't argue with talent. You know, her music is not always the sort of thing that I would listen to, but it's genuinely impossible to argue that she's bad at singing. Oh God, yeah, I totally. Yeah. She's a fantastic singer. I mean, Cher's a fantastic singer too. Like, she's got a very unique, different voice. But mm. you know, she's she's objectively a great singer. Um, she's objectively uh, a great tweeter. We have to we have to add that. <laughs> but but I think um, but like yeah, Christina Aguilera's pop music I'm okay with. I don't know if it's because she was part of this ensemble, um, and the the meant yeah. Oh, um, in theory, you're meant to be learning about these different characters and learning more about Arrival and things. And when they had a group down to the end, it's just all about her. And yeah. How she just holds this note, it just, it, it just tipped me into getting a little irritated by it. But that's just me. And that's, but that, that's why the sort of stuff about it being a family doesn't work, does it? Because we know everything there is to know about Ali. We know that she's perfect. We know that Kristen Bell's character is a drunken psychopath and <laughs> everyone else is just like a body in a, in stockings. Like there is no characterization for anyone else at all. I mean, the only characterization's negative. There is no characterization, you're correct. But, um, you know, I learned that, like, you know, a couple of them went off to get pizza. They did, they did a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> and then they discovered she can sing as well as dance. Whoa! And then they they invite her to Peter and <laughs> yeah, I think Me... that's that's the epitaph for this film, isn't it? It's a it's a story about someone who could sing and danced and liked pizza and who <laughs> and who understands air rights. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a pretty good plot synopsis, I think. Uh, any any further observations before we leave off for this week? No, I think that's that's pretty much covered it. I mean, I mean, I'm sure I'll think of little random things afterwards. I'm sure, but um, it's been fun chatting about it and what I perceive as the flaws in it. Really, um, there'll be little things going off in your head like afterwards. I think uh, the one thing that. <laughs> that I want to bring up is is quite a topical thing. It's actually, believe it or not, quite topical for us to be talking about this movie uh, now, because this was the first time that it started to be widely discussed that the Golden Globes are really bad. Um, because in 20, uh, 2010 or 2011, whenever this was eligible, uh, this was nominated for Best Comedy or Musical at the Golden Globes, along with other quality super hits, uh, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, Oof. Red, <laughs> and The Tourist, starring Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie. 
Oh God, I can't even remember that film, but okay, yeah. <laughs> and and people started to look into this and say, how, how are these films getting nominations? And it turns out that handing the Hollywood Foreign Press Association quite a lot of money plays a part in it. Wow. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's like that, it's that meme where the person is sort of pushing a domino over and the dominoes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the big domino is uh, major networks drop the Golden Globes and the little Mm. domino is Christina Aguilera's agent writes to a studio saying, have you got a film for Christina? It's interesting, isn't it? And yeah, there's been a huge amount of criticism and like and studios dropping the golden globes recently as you say mm. um it's all a massive conspiracy man i, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> this is this is my q went on i want to know how Cher got a best actress in a musical or comedy <laughs> nomination for burlesque this is my q went on i mean actually I said it like jokingly, but it is actually a conspiracy. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but about but about Cher's nomination, as you say, nothing actually important. You know, like the moon landings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And on that bombshell, listeners. <laughs> Uh, we'll say goodbye to you for another week please if you've enjoyed the show leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice because uh, that that's it's just a simple thing but it helps us out uh, if you have enough money to get us nominated for best musical or comedy at the golden globes you know i i know we're a podcast but you know the tourist is not a musical or a comedy so who cares about categories anymore um yeah, if you can do that, that'd be great. If you donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show, you can get lots of goodies, including a bonus episode of Pop Screen every month that will be unavailable anywhere else. But until then, that's been your lot from the show. I've been Graham. I've been Joe. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>